hey, welcome to Real Church. Thank you for being a part of our services today. But before we get into our message, I want to take a moment just to say thank you and to remember all of those who have sacrificed their lives for our freedom. You know, we always take a moment to honor and to remember those that have given their life because freedom is not free. We know that our spiritual freedom took the death of Jesus on the cross and our physical freedom in this country has taken the lives of many wonderful men and women who have sacrificed their lives to keep our country free. Take a look at this now as we remember. Sometime back I received in the name of our country the bodies of four Marines who had died while on active duty. I said then that there is a special sadness that accompanies the death of a serviceman, for we're never quite good enough to them. Not really, we can't be, because what they gave us is beyond our powers to repay. And so when a serviceman dies, it's a tear in the fabric, a break in the hole, and all we can do is remember. It is, in a way, an odd thing to honor those who died in defense of our country, in defense of us, in wars far away. The imagination plays a trick. We see these soldiers in our mind as old and wise. We see them as something like the founding fathers, grave and gray-haired. But most of them were boys when they died, and they gave up two lives, the one they were living and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country, for us. We owe them a debt we can never repay. All we can do is remember them and what they did and why they had to be brave for us. Hey, well, good morning and welcome to Real Church. This is Pastor Norman. I'm so excited that you're joining us this morning. Uh, if you are joining us online, thank you for being with us. But if you are in the Gunnersville area, this morning at 1045, we are having uh, Church at the Lake. And we would love to invite you out to Civitan Park right here in Gunnersville for you to be a part of this service live and in person. But if you're joining us this morning online, thank you for being with us. And uh, today, uh, this is kind of a standalone sermon call for such a time as this. And, and you know, when we get talk about for such a time as this, what does that really mean? Well, um, you know, it really calls to question, it calls to question why we're here. In fact, I think that's the question we need to ask. Why? Why are you positioned where you are at this moment? Why do you have the job you have? Uh, why do you live where you live? Why do you go to school where you go to school? Why do you go to church where you go to church? Well, I believe that it's because God has placed you and assigned you where he wants you to be. You are where God wants you to be at this pivotal time in history. In fact, that's, that's really what we're going to talk about today in the story of Esther. Esther came to this pivotal moment. And, you know, we all have pivotal moments in our life. You know, in, in a, 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 a great football game, there's this pivotal moment where your team needs to pull off that big play to win the game. Or, or maybe in a battle, it's where there's the surge and the press through. You know, in, in World War II, D-Day was one of those pivotal moments. And so many men sacrificed their lives. But because of that push, the Allies won the war. In business, it's the, the pivotal moment when you break, uh, break even, you go beyond the red and you get into the black. A lot of times that's called Black Friday. 
You know, we all have pivotal moments, and, and when I think about where we are today, when I think about culture right now and the signs of the time and the moment that we may be living in, and I think we may be in the end times, and if we're in the end times, think of the incredible opportunity and the incredible responsibility that we have for such a time as this. That God has placed us and entrusted us to be here during these end times and in these critical, pivotal moments to make a difference. You see, I don't believe that, that God put you here just to go through life, but God gave you a moment just like he did Queen Esther. And, and we read this passage of Scripture from Esther 4, 14, the last part of that verse, and, and Mordecai is actually speaking to her, says, And who knows, but you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. It may very well be our Lord and Savior Jesus challenging us with that same thing that He has placed us in this critical moment, at this pivotal moment in time for us to be here. In other words, God has placed you where you are, doing what you're doing with the resources that you have, I believe, to build His kingdom to make a difference in these last days. God has created you for a divine appointment. In other words, you're here for such a time as this. You're here for this moment, and that is exactly what happened with Esther. It's where God has given you, that. it's that God-given niche that He has created you for. You see, I believe that, that when you think about who are key players in the body of Christ, who are key players in this moment of history, most of you would think, well, I'm not a great evangelist, I'm not a great missionary, I, I'm not running a, a, a you know, 501c3, I'm not doing all of these things. But I want to challenge you today that this morning, this day that God may be saying to you, look in the mirror. The person I'm looking for is Y-O-U. I'm looking for somebody who's willing to step up. And, and, and that's exactly what this, this Jewish girl, Esther, did. In this strategic spot that God had placed her in for such a time as this to rescue her people. And so today, as we kind of look at a quick overview of this story, I want to look at some big ideas. Here's number one. At that time in this story, God's people are in crisis. In 538 B.C., uh, the Jews were living uh, exiled in Persia. Now, some of them had gone back to their Jewish homeland to try to rebuild the temple, but a lot of the Jews were afraid to return to the homeland, yet they wanted to live in the safety of Persia. And, and this, is, this story is um, actually set in the capital city of Susa. And um, all of these things are going on, and that's, that's the area right between Iraq and Iran. It, it's on that border, and that's the backdrop of where this story takes place. And, and what had happened is the queen, who was the queen to the king of Persia, uh, displeased him. And so the king decided, I'm going to put a call out to all of these young girls who wants to be the next queen. It was like American Idol for Queens. Hey, hey, look, she's coming along here. She's coming. Uh, uh, we're we're going to see which one is. It's a beauty pageant for who's going to be the next queen of Persia. Well, Esther, this poor Jewish orphan who had been raised by her uncle Mordecai, was raised in the admonition of the Lord. She was trained up right, and, and he was a man of God who was trusting God. And God opens up the door for her to be selected as queen. Now, she is beautiful. I mean, the king is enamored by her, and, and she is chosen. And, and, uh, but she wasn't just beautiful on the outside. She was beautiful on the inside. She had such a grace, and the king truly loved her. He was, she, she was not just another one of his harem. He truly loved her. But the one thing that he didn't find out about was that she was a Jew. Now, moving on in the story, the king's top official, Haman, he was an evil egomaniac who uh, decided 
because of Mordecai sending out by the, by the gate one day, uh, wouldn't bow down to him, he decided, I'm going to kill all the Jews. And so he goes to the king and manipulates him with the story of how bad the Jews were, and he gets the king to sign into law a, a, a decree that all the Jews can be slaughtered. And this is where what happens. I mean, the, this brings the crisis. The God's people are about to be attacked and can be killed. And, and look, Haman was out. He wanted, he wanted Mordecai dead. He wanted every Jew dead. That's the kind of day that was set up for them. And that's what brought this problem, this crisis. Well, you know, in America today, we're not facing a physical threat of death. But God's people are still in crisis. They're in crisis for a need for truth. In fact, look at this from Hosea 4, 6. It says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge, I also rejected you as my priest. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. You see, people are dying for truth. So many people are hungering for truth, and at the same time, they don't want to believe the truth. There's so many people that are running, and it's like, well, this is my truth, and this is my truth, but they're dying for a lack of knowledge of truth. And yet, what they want to do in, today, in today's American culture, what we're dealing with is there's a threat of the death of our nuclear family of mom and dad and kids. There's the threat of the death of morality, of people living a moral, godly life. There's, there's you know, the, 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 the threat of being canceled because that's really what they're trying to do with truth is they, they want their truth and they want to manipulate the truth, but they'll cancel anybody who speaks the truth of God, especially if you're talking about Jesus. You see, there's also an attack on God's people, and there is the threat of the death of faith. Now, n know this. The church is never going to die. The, the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is never going to die. But there is a, an all-out attack on that. It's old. It doesn't, ha it doesn't speak to today. It doesn't minister. To, you know, all of that is, is hateful and mean and stuff. And guess what? That's not what it is. It's the truth. And the truth is the thing that sets us free. But that is where we're living. And whenever you have the, the people of God, you're going to have the enemy of God's people. Whenever God's truth is lifted up, you're going to have the enemies of that truth. And so, just like in those times, God's people are in crisis. Here's the second point. God's person has been discovered. You see, God had a person to step up in this situation, and her name was Esther. Now, if you've ever been broken, had brokenness in your life, if you've ever experienced that, then I'm telling you, this story's gonna speak to you. If you've ever been through a tough time where you feel crushed by life, well, I want you to know that you will be able to get so much out of this story because Queen Esther didn't start off as queen. She start, started off as a little girl who must have cried herself to sleep because mom and dad weren't there. She was orphaned. But years later, because she had been taken and, and raised by her uncle Mordecai, and she was, she was raised up, and even though she had all of these things in her past, she became this beautiful, special person that God had created her to be. And he raised her up, when the call for that new queen came, and, and, and even though in spite of her brokenness, God used her. In spite of what her past could have said, well, she's just an orphan, she's broken, she, she can't do it. God used her, and God will do the same thing for you. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. In other words, God can take you in your brokenness. God took me in my brokenness, and he said, Son, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to use you in such a way that when people look at you, they're going to go, Well, that can't be, be Norm. That has to be God because of they, people seeing my past and hearing about my past, and they're like, No, how, how can God use somebody like that? Well, he can because what he does is he restores, and he, 
He qualifies those he calls. So here's what happened. Mordecai sends a note to Esther and says, Look, you've got to, to know this, that they are going to kill all the Jews. You have got to go and speak to the king for us. But you see, in those days, there was a law that said that if you went uninvited into the king, you could be killed on sight. If the king didn't raise his golden scepter, you couldn't be accepted and you could be killed on sight. And, and so she writes back this in, Ephes uh, in Esther, excuse me, Esther 4, 10 and 11. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's official and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends his golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. You see, the king had been busy. We don't know exactly what was going on, but Esther hadn't seen the king in 30 days. Now, he may have been on a, a whirlwind tour of, of some of the provinces. We don't know. But the king had, had been around, and she hadn't seen him. And so there was a reluctancy. She was like, I don't know what to do. I don't think I can do this. She thought something I bet some of you think. Esther didn't feel she was the person for God's job. She didn't feel like, hey, how can I do this? I, I'm, I'm, if I go in there, I mean, I'm, I'm laying it all on the line. I'm not sure if I'm the, the person for this. Maybe there's somebody else that can go. But guys, God had placed her there. God had given her, a Jew had access to the highest official, and she was the queen. She was the queen, but, but if she went in, even as the queen, and violated that law, she could lose everything. But look at what Mordecai really challenges her. And this is what he says in verse 13 and 14. He sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. See, he challenged her. He said, hey, look, I know all of this is going on, but look at what is happening here. Maybe, just maybe, God has put you at this place for such a time as this. It's that pivotal moment. And Esther is in that pivotal moment. If you do nothing, he says, look, this is the, the kind of faith that Mordecai had, Mordecai had. He said, look, you don't do it. God's going to raise up another deliverer. I know he's going to take care of us. But if you do this, Look at the opportunity that you have to save God's people. Now, it was a risk. It was a risk. But I believe that she was challenged in her spirit. She was challenged in her heart that, hey, I've got this opportunity, and I need to step up to the plate. I need to step up for such a time as this. I mentioned a while ago, she was beautiful on the outside. But the question mark, is she beautiful on the inside? And I believe that as we look at these verses, we see the answer to that. We see the answer to that. We see what is in Esther's heart. And you know, even the Lord says to be careful how we look. In fact, he told Eli when he was going to anoint David the king, he didn't know it was going to be David, but he had sent him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance, or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outer appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You see, when he sent Samuel to anoint David, what he had done is he said, he looked at uh, the first son of Jesse and said, oh, I'm going to anoint him. No, no, not him. Second, no, third, oh, he, maybe. He was looking at the outer appearance and God said, don't look at the outer appearance. That's what man does. Look at the heart. So my question is, 
What is God looking for in your heart? What is he looking for in a heart that is ready for such a time as this? Here's, here's a couple things. There, the first thing is God is looking for a teachable heart. He's looking for a teachable heart. You see, when, when uh, Esther gets this word back from Mordecai, I mean, she could have she copped an attitude with him, even though he had raised her, even though she was uh, his, his uh, adopted daughter. I mean, she could have raised, look, I am I'm Miss VIP. I am the queen of Persia. How dare you tell me what to do? But she didn't. She had a submitted heart to the man of God. She listened to the word that he was sending, and, and she was teachable. Guys, it's so important that we remain teachable. It doesn't matter how old we get. We need to have a teachable spirit, a teachable heart, so that God can continue to teach us. If we're going to be ready for our such a time as this, we're going to have to have a teachable heart. This is what Proverbs 9.9 9 says. Instruct the wise, and they be, will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. Man, I want to be wiser. I want to add to my learning. Well, the way I do that is I remain teachable even as I get older. Doesn't matter what position I have. Doesn't matter where I come from. Doesn't matter where I'm going. Don't matter where, what, how, how high of a, uh, of a job status I have. I can always learn something from someone. So God issues these challenges, and he's teaching us, but we have to be willing to receive his instruction. And he teaches us what? Through his word. He teaches us through pastors. He teaches us through friends. He teaches us through coworkers. He teaches us with people we go to school with. He can teach us through our boss. God can teach us different ways. It may be what you're watching, maybe on Christian TV or radio, and you're hearing something, and it's speaking to you. But I tell you, if you'll take time just this week to, to put aside some time and say God speak to me through your word stay teachable every day we ought to be asking Lord what do you want to teach me what do you want to do in me how do you want to change me because I want to stay teachable I want to be ready for that pivotal moment that may come in my life so it, we can take that step that we're supposed to take at such a time as this now here's the second one God is not just looking for a teachable heart, he's also looking for a prayerful heart. Now, if you look in this passage of Scripture, you're not going to find the word pray. But what you actually do is you find a, a, a seeking after God. Esther says this in verses 15 and 16. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Now guys, whenever we fast, we're, we're taking time, we're putting down our flesh, and we're tuning into God. Because the fasting is about seeking God, and it's about asking Him for His wisdom. So when we fast, we're putting down the flesh so we can hear from God. Because we want to be teachable, but we also want to be seeking. Lord, tell me your plan. Tell, lead me in your ways. So he, she says, have them fast for me. Do not eat or drink for these for three days or night, and I, I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And we'll finish the rest of that verse in just a second. You see, what she did is she was wi willing to lay down everything. She, she knew that if she was going to go before the king, she couldn't go in her own power, in her own strength. She had to have God's wisdom. So what she did is she sought God for three days. She set aside, set apart uh, eating, and she focused on God, and she was getting his wisdom and his direction and his guidance. And guys, when we get that wisdom and direction and guidance, we can go and do anything because she was relying on God's thoughts to be her thought. She was relying on God's wisdom and power to take her through that. And see, we're, we're not the source. I want you to get this. We are not the source to fulfill our divine appointment. We don't, we, we're not supposed to be that source. In fact, wherever God puts us, he's going to put us in a place of faith where we're going to have to push through and we're going to have to trust him. We're going to have to get to that point where we understand God is our source, our complete source. 
And, and, and the Holy Spirit is going to empower us and strengthen us to take those steps. And that's when we're going to see our fulfillment of that divine appointment because we're going to be stepping in, not in our own strength, but when we're completely and totally trusting in God. And God says, okay, I'm going to show you my great power and my strength in this as you trust in me. But it takes a prayerful heart. So this coming week, I, I challenge you, will you take some time, set aside some time to seek God, maybe even skip a meal or fast a day or do something to seek God God, why do you have me here? What's my purpose? And you begin to ask the Lord, what, why am I here for such a time as this? And get God's wisdom and direction and guidance in that. And it also helps you focus on letting God be your source. He's looking for a prayerful heart. Here's the third thing. God's looking for a teachable heart. He's looking for a prayerful heart. God is also looking for a sacrificial heart. He's looking for a heart that's willing to give of their time, talent, and treasure. Everything that they got. In fact, Esther says in the end of verse 16, he says, she says, I'm going to go in even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. She's going, I'm going all in. All in. If I lose it all, I lose it all. But she was willing to lay it down. She was willing to risk it, everything. And she was going to go before her husband. And she wasn't going to casually just stroll in there because you didn't do that in those days. In fact, a lot of times the reason why you couldn't just enter into a king uh, before that is because there were many plots to kill kings in those days. And so if somebody just came walking in, they didn't ask questions first. They started striking them down because they thought they were in there to kill the king. And you had to be ready. And so when she goes in, you think of this. She's risking every bit of her legacy with no promise, no guarantee of a positive outcome. She's willing to take that step of faith. And guys, this is what really sacrificing is. It's taking a step of faith. I'm willing to give of myself. I'm willing to give of my time, of my talent, of my treasure. I'm willing to give even when maybe it doesn't make sense to give. I'm going to risk it all. And I mean, just stop for a moment and put yourself in her place. Put yourself in her place for a moment. She is about to, you know, the king doesn't know she's a Jew. If she goes in there and tells him this, he's going to know she's a Jew. She's you know, she's still the queen. She's got all the wealth. She's got all of these things. People are there to serve her. And, and she's walking in there, and she could lose her life, not just her status, not just her wealth, but she's willing to risk all of that for this moment because she goes, I've got to step up. Somebody's got to step up and be that person in this pivotal moment for such a time as this. I've got to do this. And... So she says, okay, I'm willing to take this step. I'm going to perish. If I perish, I perish. I'm just going to do this. I'm going to trust you. And guys, that's where we have to get because we're going to get to this pivotal moment and you're going to be standing there at the door. Are you going to take that step of faith? It's going to be risky. You're going to have to risk something. You're, you may have to risk the status that you have. You may have to risk some money. You may have to risk some uh, um, attention that you have or position that you have because you're willing to take the step of faith to answer God's call for such a time as this and it's in that pivotal moment that we wrestle back and forth you see God's challenging our values what's really important to us sitting back and being comfortable and being okay within our four walls and go, I just, I got, I'm happy in my American life and everything's going good and stuff. Are we going to be willing to step out and risk it to see our community, our region, our, our nation changed? This world changed. Look, God's going to challenge us. He's going to challenge how convenient it is for you to serve. He's going to challenge you, well, well, but God, I would, but it, it just doesn't work in my schedule. You know, we're really busy. Well, it may take sacrifice. A sacrificial heart says, God, if it's, all, if it's really what you want me to do, I'll sacrifice something. Oh, you want me to help this missionary? Oh, well, I don't see that in my budget. Oh, I'm going to have to sacrifice something. 
God's looking for a sacrificial heart. He's looking for that. Really, let, let me ask you this question. What does God see when he sees your heart? Does he see a teachable heart? Does he see a prayerful heart that's seeking after him and getting his wisdom and guidance and things? Does he see a sacrificial heart that's willing to put yourself second and put him first in everything? Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fu fully committed to him. In other words, God is saying, I'm looking all over the earth that I may strongly support, that I may really be there, strengthen and help those whose hearts are fully committed to me. Esther had to get to the point where, all right, enough of the easy life, I'm going to risk it all. And so what she did is she, she took the step. She took the step to go in. She took the step and she said, if I perish, I perish. You know, you may ask, well, what does it matter if I'm involved at church or, or I'm involved in this outreach or doing this or that or the other? You would go, it really doesn't matter. I mean, it, you know, there's other people to do it. Yes, there are. God will always raise up somebody else. But if you miss your pivotal moment, you're missing out. You're the one that loses, not God, because God will find someone else. But the bigger, bigger thing that's involved in this is it shows your heart. Where's your heart at? Is your heart after God or is your heart after comfort and convenience? Now, I know this may sound like a tough word. You go, this is Memorial Day weekend. We're supposed to be, it's supposed to be relaxed and we're starting summer and everything. Well, really, I want to challenge us through this message to, to have summer on purpose. In other words, let's not just let down the guard and, and quit doing the things that keep us faithful during the summer, but let's serve with purpose. Let's be involved in purpose. You know, so many times the church has to, to shut down to, to about 50% a lot of times in summer, and I'm talking about churches nationally and around the world because summertime hits and everybody vacates. And I understand you want vacation. I know you want downtime. And I know after being cooped up for the last year, that's like in your mind I've got to get out of here but I'm telling you that God is saying you're at a pivotal moment what are you going to do with this moment are you going to let somebody else take your your shot see God's not going not going to send an angel to to kick on your door and go hey get out get after this he's not going to send flashes of thunder and lightning and sh shake you to wake you and say hey get up wake up He's going to put the opportunity in front of you, and you've got to make a choice from your heart. Am I going to be teachable? Am I going to have a prayerful heart that's seeking after what he wants and not what I want? And am I going to have a sacrificial heart that's willing to sacrifice a little bit to fulfill God's purpose? See, God has given you your job and your position, your resources. He's educated you. And, and done all of these things for you. And God's opened up these opportunities for you. And opti but he's done it to optimize you for, the kingdom, for his kingdom purpose. And, and I don't believe that God did all of this so that we can sit back on our laurels and eat, eat peaches and, and post long Facebook posts. I don't believe that's what God's called us to do because if we truly are in the end times... And I believe that we got to live like every single day is the last day of our life. Because it may be. And if these are truly the end times, and 10 years, 15, 20, 5, 7, I don't know how long we've got left. But if these are the end times, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do? Is it going to be about building our kingdom? Or is it going to be about building his kingdom? You see... To miss your kingdom assignment because you have become too caught up in your personal kingdom itself is the greatest tragedy you could ever face. Let me say that again. To miss your kingdom assignment because you are too caught up 
And because you have become too caught up in your personal kingdom itself is the greatest tragedy you could ever face. Because you would miss your pivotal moment. You would miss this moment for such a time as this. But see, Esther didn't miss her moment. She took the risk. And when, she, when you take that risk, here's, what's ha- here's what happens. The last point, God's power is on display. God displays his power and he works through us. When we take that step of faith, when we get to that pivotal moment and say, I'm going to do it, I'm going to step out, that's when God meets us there and he does great things. You see, Esther came through those doors and she was waiting. All right, is somebody going to come and run a sword through me? It, 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 what's going to happen in this moment? And as she came in, the king looked up and he raised his golden scepter. And she had access to him. And I'm going to fast forward to the end. And when she finally tells him, after a couple meals, when she finally tells him what is happening, Haman's plan of destroying the Jews is taken care of in a moment's notice. And Haman is actually hung on the very gallows he was planning to to hang Mordecai on. I'm telling you guys, God does super turnarounds. He will turn around your life. He will turn around your situation. He he will change things. And, And when he does, I mean, he is showing off. He's showing how great and awesome and powerful he is. You know, Job says it this way. God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Because he shows, hey, look, look. Hey, this is who I am. I want you to see how great I am. But people get miss it. It, it. This is from Psalm 68. It says, you, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Why? Because what God wants to do is show himself powerful. He wants to display his power through his people. And if we're going to fulfill our time, our such a time as this moment, if we're going to fulfill that, if we're going to meet this moment, this pivotal moment, we're going to have to have his power and his strength. Daniel said it this way. And he said, praise be to the, praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. More than anything today, that's what his church needs. He needs. We need wisdom. We need power functioning in our midst. We need God to do such a supernatural work. I'm telling you, this, this is the distinction, though, guys. There's a correlation. There's a connection. There's a connection here. And, and, and we've, got, we've got to see that. We've got to see that God wants to do something. But you go, but pastor... I'm at the end of my rope. I've been through this whole COVID thing. You don't know what the last year's been like. We've been struggling financially. We've been doing that. Well, if you've been caught, you're struggling today, and you've been caught between a rock and a hard place, I want you to know you are the exact perfect candidate that God's looking for. He's looking for somebody that may be in crisis. God's people in crisis, what is he doing? He's looking for a person that will step up, a person that is... chosen by God to step up are you willing to step up in your family are you willing to step up in this church are you willing to to be that person who God wants to say for such a time as this I want to display my power for such a time as this I want to release my strength I want to release my wisdom my power my deliverance through you the link that we have is this The link between God's people in crisis and God's power on display is God's person. Are you that person? Are you God's person? Are you the person that's supposed to step up? So many times we're looking for somebody else. Well, can't somebody else do it? Well, well, why won't somebody else step up? Why don't you? Why don't you say, God, here am I. Send me. Are we willing to take that step? Now, I know this is a challenging message. I know this may be, you know, you're going, well, why? Why this message and why now? Because I believe, and I've mentioned for several weeks, I believe we're at a pivotal point. We're at a pivotal point in the history of real church. 
that we need, we're about to take some major steps of faith. We're about to take some major steps, and it's going to take everybody in Real Church, everybody who calls this church their home, that's a partner at Real Church, every attender at Real Church that needs to go all in like Esther did and say, you can count on me. I'm going to do this because if we're going to fulfill the mandate that God has for Real Church to impact this community. Now, listen, we're partnering with our other brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not the only church on the block. There's plenty of churches here in town, but God has a mandate for our church. And God and you are the church. You, you, uh, the church is not the building, the church of the people. Church is the people. Let me say that again. Church is the people. And you are the church. And so you've got to ask yourself, what do I want to see in this church take place? Well, it's going to require all of us to dive in, to take that step of faith. Everybody saying, count on me. Because, guys, I don't know about you, but I want to do something bigger than me. I want to do something that's going to last into eternity. I want to do something that when we leave this planet, we can go, we made a difference in Gunnersville, Alabama. We made a difference in Marshall County. We made a difference in these communities. We made a different in, difference in these lives. We impacted Northeast Alabama. We're, we made a difference. We changed things because we were willing to be teachable. We were willing to seek God with a prayerful heart. We were willing to be sacrificial and throw in everything we had to make a difference. So how can you do this? Well, I'm going to give you a few very practical ways. And I'm going to go through them very quickly. Number one, help with your heart. Help with your heart. Get your heart connected to what God wants to do through Real Church and in this community. Get your heart connected so that when you also get put Him first in your life. I mean, when you come in here to worship Him, be, don't come in dra dragging all your problems. With, come in with a, a praise in your heart so that when you get into His presence, see, the Bible says He inhabits the praises of His people. Every time we come together, we come together with purpose and with our hearts ready to worship God. And you know what? When God shows up, the impact that can take place, God can do more in a moment than I can do in a lifetime. Get connected with your heart to other people to some other loving hearts in a, a little community of faith in a table group can you get your heart connected that way we got table groups around here if you just are a tender here's what i want to challenge you get connected deeper maybe even this summer there's somebody in church after a after a sunday morning service going hey let's go have lunch together let me get to know you maybe you need to find another heart that you can connect with so that you can join and be fitly joined together as the body of Christ and we can move forward. I'm telling you, it can make a difference. Here's the second thing, connect with your head. Think about this for a moment. What's going to change this world? Is it going to be government, education, science, technology, business? Not one of those things are going to change this world. But you know what can change this world? The hope, of G the hope of the world is Jesus, and the power of his gospel is expressed through the church. The, the one thing that can change the church, change the world, is the church. That's the thing that can change the world, is a church who's fully devoted to Christ and what he wants to accomplish. We can change the world. Now, that doesn't mean that that the world's going to turn out, everything's going to be great. I read, read the end of the book. It's going to get pretty bad at the end of the book. But you know what? We can change the world in so many people's lives. We can change our community by reaching people for Christ. We can show them the love of Jesus. We can lead them to a, a living, breathing relationship with Christ that will make a difference for all eternity. We can change the world as we share Jesus. Help with your hands and your feet. Help with your hands and your feet. In other words, look, we can, we can go and put our hands to ministry. 
One of the ways you can put your hands to ministry is through a food ministry, but there's way more than that. And ministering to kids and, and doing small groups and, and being in this community. And guys, we got so many other outreaches we want to do. We just need more hands. And the other thing you can do is, is, is be a part. Like, make a commitment. And, I, and this is what I was talking about, summer on purpose. So many times we get to summer and we kind of let go of our regular routines of things. And we get out of the habit of doing the good things that we need to do, that we do most of the time through the year. And a lot of people during uh, this coronavirus has got out of the habit of coming to church because, well, I don't want to be around people because people are sick and I don't want to do this or I don't want to wear a mask or I don't want to do this. And we've come up with a lot of excuses not to show up and be part of the body of Christ. I want to challenge you to make a commitment that you will be here don't, don't use summer as a time to check out and go, well, we get back into church in August. No, guess what? Jesus needs to be praised in June and July. Jesus needs to be lived for in June and July. Jesus needs to be in your family in June or July. So get your kids here and we'll minister to them. Get your family here and be a part of actively apart and then you won't have to rev up in august to try to get back into the swing of things because you never get out of the swing of things and then help with your treasure help with your treasure give and 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 you know some of you have been given a, a certain percentage but it hadn't been the full tithe i challenge you give the full tithe give a full 10% because when, whenever we put God first in any area of our life, when we give him the full measure of putting him first, and he says, return the tithe to me. When we give the tithe, then the 90% is blessed better than even if you kept, only gave 7%, God will meet you at your point of faith. But I'm telling you, you give that 10%, God will bless the 90% and make it go farther than the 10%. The, the, the 90% ever would. I'm telling you, the, you, you, if you trust God, God will do a miracle in your finances. So let's bring this all to a close. Pastor, why, why are you preaching this on Memorial Day weekend? There's a lot of people out going around. Here's why I'm preaching it. Because it's time for us to step up, not step back. It's time for us to progress, not re regress. It's time for us to move forward, not settle into the comfort. And I know what summer's like, and I know the summer mentality. But even in the summertime, serving Jesus doesn't change. My lifestyle, the way I live for Jesus, is 24-7, 365. And the way I handle my life the way, the way I serve, the way I minister, all of that. Look, there's impo it's important to have times of rest. But, but when we're all pulling together, I'm telling you, as a body of believers, here's what will happen. We will see God do a miracle. We will see God do a miracle. And I know he wants to. Let me end with this poem by Edward Everett Hale. He says, I am only one. But still, I am one. I cannot do everything, but still, I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, you know, that's where some people, well, I can't do everything, so I'm just going to stop. Here's what he goes on. I will not refuse to do something that I can do. You see, I'm not going to refuse to do something just because I can't do everything. I'm going to do what I can do. God's person has been discovered, and that person, I believe, is you and me. And if we'll step up, God would do miracles through us to make a difference in this community. Let's pray. Father, right now, I pray that your people who are called by your name well, Lord, you'll, they'll hear this message and they will humble themselves and pray. And we will turn from any, any compromise that we've got in our life, any wicked way in us, and we'll seek your face. 
And Lord, you said you would hear from heaven and you would come and heal our land. Lord, I'm praying for, I'm praying for a supernatural impact in Marshall County, in Gunnersville, in this surrounding area, in Grant and Albertville and, and Boaz and, and Sneed and, 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 and Douglas and, and, and Father Asbury and, and Arab and, and uh, Union Grove, all of the surrounding area. Lord, I pray from the north, south, and east, and west that you would make an impact on our community, that you would change our community, and that, Father, we would be the people that would be those people at the pivotal moment to step into the fray, to step into the fight and say, I'll do it for such a time as this because I know I'm called. I know I'm I equip because the Lord is equipping me and I have a heart that is teachable to learn from him I have a heart that's seeking after him in prayer and wanting to have his wisdom and guidance and I have a heart that's sacrificial that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to win the battle thank you father for mobilizing your church like never before. And Father, I pray, if there's anyone that's listening to my voice that doesn't know you, that they would just take a moment and they would call on you. You said that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and they will ask Jesus to come to be the Lord of their life. They'll ask him to forgive their sins and they will give their life completely and totally to him. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray God bless you and strengthen you. I pray that God take this and get it down inside of you and stir you up like never before so that you become everything he wants you to be because you are a person at this pivotal moment for such a time as this. Well, thank you for joining us this week at Real Church. I pray that the message has been an encouraging and inspiring one. Also, join us next week as we kick off a brand new series called this is the way it's going to be a great series where we're going to kind of play off the mandalorian this is the way and uh talk about the way the lord works through us and the way he wants to speak and minister through us also too if you call real church your home we will encourage you to participate in giving through our giving portal at realchurchal.com. You can click on the give button there and give, or you can text to give, 77977. Text realchurchal, follow the prompts to give. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving as you continue to sow in to the ministry and mission of Real Church. God bless you. Have a great weekend.